tonight we open up again uh, to our Old Testament, continuing in our 66 books series. And this is uh, the fourth week where we find ourselves on the third book of Moses, or the third book of the law, Leviticus. Unfortunately, this book has been known to try one's patience, confuse the mind, quench one's passion for Bible study, and bring well-intentioned reading plans to a swift end in February of the new year. Perhaps you know exactly what I'm talking about. You've been in that boat before. And so just at the outset, let's acknowledge that for so many of us, and not without any warrant, Leviticus is a difficult book in our Bibles. It's hard. You're slugging your way through. You feel through law after law, commandment after commandment about what can feel like to us the same things. There's blood everywhere. There's a priest and there are sinners. And it's just hard at times to distinguish what's happening in the book. But I would submit to you that if you don't love Leviticus, even before you understand everything in it, if you don't love Leviticus, you don't understand Leviticus. The reason that we would lack a love, an admiration, a passion even for this book is only due to our lack of understanding. All of Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness so that the man of God might be fully equipped, Scripture says. And so Leviticus is included in that all of Scripture. All of Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable. Leviticus is profitable. Let me just read to you from J.C. Ryle in, uh, in How Readest Thou. That's the book that we give away to people. And, and that book, I think, will never be replaced uh, for, for the giveaway book. It's, we looked for years, really. We're, we're wanting a book that captured what our church is about. If somebody visits and never comes back, then what we give them for free, we want to... Uh, capture really what we love most, and that is God as he is revealed in his word. And so that book is just a perfect summary of that. Here's what J.C. Ryle says when he's talking about the prophet of all of scripture. And I think this applies well to a book like Leviticus. He says, think not for a moment that any part of this precious book is not profitable. Think not that such portions as catalogs and pedigrees, as Leviticus, and the description of Ezekiel's temple are useless and without value. Believe me, it is childish folly to question the usefulness of any word in the Bible merely because our eyes at present do not see its use. Come with me and look for a moment at the book of nature, and I will show you things of which you do not see the use. Place yourself in imagination by the side of an Australian gold digging and observe the earth that is drawn up from its bottom. It is likely that your unpracticed eye will see nothing in that heap but rubbish and dirt and stones. And yet that very heap of earth may prove on washing to be full of particles of the purest gold. It is just the same with the Bible. We see but a little of it now. We shall find hereafter that every word of it contained gold. You should think of Leviticus this way. I'm convinced that a part of our lack of admiration, lack of confidence, in the parts of scripture that we don't yet understand as clearly as we would like is because we have yet to believe the parts of scripture that we do understand clearly 
Like what I just quoted from 2 Timothy 3, every scripture, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable. If we would but believe that, even when we lack clarity on our own and come to portions of scripture that seem not clear to us, if we just held on to the truth that, yes, but this is profitable, then those fruit of scripture that don't seem clear to us would actually yield themselves more readily because we are coming to it with a believing heart. We should do that with the book of Leviticus. With that, let's just turn our attention to this book. I want to give you first the purpose of the book and then just briefly give you an outline of the book. As Ben discussed last week in the book of Exodus being given to us uh, or to that original audience, which is the same purpose that's been given to us, that men might know Yahweh in a unique way as the one who rescued his people from Egypt, that perfectly prepares us to land ourselves in Leviticus on the heels of Exodus. And here is what Leviticus is all about. Here's how I would summarize the purpose for which Leviticus was written. In anticipation of God's abiding presence among his people, Leviticus details the standard of holiness for maintaining close, favorable proximity to Yahweh, the only holy God of Israel. This is what Leviticus is doing. This book was written, as we will see, in anticipation of God's abiding presence among his people. And you could say abiding or earthly presence. This is about him dwelling on earth with his people. We'll see that over and over and over and over and over again in Leviticus. God is omnipresent. That word omni mean being all present. He is present everywhere. Everywhere God is, meaning whatever he is, he is in every single place possible. But Leviticus doesn't just reveal an omnipresent God. It reveals an especially present God, uniquely present with his people. And so this anticipates that God has chosen to dwell uniquely among his people in a way that he is not everywhere, but he has chosen to be especially among his people. And in order for that God to abide on earth with his people, then he must detail, he must give them a standard of holiness in order for them to maintain this close and favorable proximity with him. That's all of Leviticus could be fit into that paradigm. Uh, Everything that Leviticus says fits within that framework that God is laying out for his people very clearly, if you want me to dwell in your midst, and if you want to dwell near me without being incinerated by my holiness, then you must follow this written code. And so everything that you see is a part of that articulation from God. Uh, Many theologians have accurately captured that the theme of the preeminent theme, a preeminent theme of Leviticus is the holiness of God or the holiness of his people, just holiness as a banner over the book. And that's right. But I'm convinced that if you miss this dual element besides the holiness of God and and the holiness that he requires of his people, if you miss this other theme of God's presence or God's proximity with his people, then you really miss the point of Leviticus. The two have to go together. If God were just holy in his people, he's already revealed that in Exodus. That's not new information to the Israelites or to God's people. He's revealed himself as holy. What he has not revealed to his people 
until Leviticus is how that holiness will comfortably dwell in the midst of a sinful people. That's unique to Leviticus. That's why Leviticus had to be written in all of the laws. They don't know yet how are we going to dwell near so holy of a God. And so both of these themes have to go hand in hand, God's presence as well as God's holiness. Just to outline, and I'm, I'm borrowing an outline from uh, John MacArthur, what he gives in his uh, Bible commentary, his whole Bible commentary, and then just with a, a slight emendation to what he's got there, really you could break Leviticus up into basically five sections, and you'll have them here on these, these major headings on the outline. First, it opens with laws pertaining to sacrifice. That's significant. And we'll see that and see why in, in just a second. The book opens with laws about sacrifices and there is blood absolutely everywhere. Within these laws pertaining to sacrifice, you get laws for the laity, just the, the common man, Burnt offerings, grain offerings, peace offerings, sin offerings, and trespass offerings, those five offerings. And then you get laws or legislation for the priesthood, how they're to offer these things. And then again, burnt offerings, grain offerings, sin offerings, trespass offerings, and then peace offerings with some concluding remarks. So that's the, the opening from chapter 1 all the way through chapter 7, you get laws about how to make sacrifices and what purposes the sacrifices serve, all those details that they needed about sacrifices. And then God establishes his priesthood. He has Moses set up the priesthood and then do sort of a handoff to Aaron and his sons. That takes us from chapters 8 through chapter 10. So we get the ordination of Aaron and his sons, as well as the first sacrifices for them. And then his sons famously botch their first attempt at offering a sacrifice. God kills them, we'll, we'll see in chapter 10, for wrongly offering sacrifices outside of what he's prescribed. And then we get in chapters 11 through 16, uh, basically the prescriptions for uncleanness, or you could say 11 through 15. Um, I would argue that 16 is, is not in the same vein as the prescription for uncleanness, but 16 is a unique, holds a unique place in Leviticus. After these prescriptions for uncleanness, dealing with unclean animals, uncleanness of childbirth, uncleanness of diseases in chapter 13, uncleanness of diseases in chapter 14, or how to cleanse those diseases in 14, and then uncleanness of certain discharges in 15. Then you get the Day of Atonement in chapter 16. And that was that all-important day, Yom Kippur, when the sins of the nation would be covered in one fell swoop, confessed by the priest, and then expiated by the priest, born away on animals. That was one day a year where they would go into the Holy of Holies, perform the prescribed rites, and have the promise of forgiveness, temporal forgiveness from God over the whole nation, just a pronouncement on the whole nation. And then you have really for the remainder of the book, chapter 17 through 27, the guidelines for practical holiness. Here's how God's people who have a holy God drawing near to them are to conduct themselves as holy, as set apart, as different from the surrounding nations. And so these guidelines for practical holiness that in the book 
include sacrifice and food, proper sexual behavior, being a good neighbor in chapter 19, uh, crimes, how to deal with and think about criminal behavior, chapter 20, instructions for priests, chapters 21 and 22, religious festivals in chapter 23, the tabernacle in 24, you get a, an account of unholy behavior in 25, chapter, uh, or 24 rather, chapter 25 deals with the sabbatical and jubilee years. Then you have an exhortation to obedience, the blessings and curses given in chapter 26, really a prophecy about what it would be like when they obeyed and what it would be like when they disobeyed. And then those things still stand because we still see them being fulfilled in our day. The curses currently, one day the blessings. And then dealing with uh, redemption of certain gifts. And that really is the, the simple outline of the book, again, all telling us how God would comfortably, favorably dwell in the midst of a, an unholy people. That's what these laws lay out for us. Everything near God, everything that God has chosen, that he has called to himself in a special way, needs to be holy because it bears an association with him. It's near him. He's called it near to himself. He's called it set apart for himself. And so everything had to be set apart because God set it apart. That included people, their conducts, their speech, their relationships. All of that had to be set apart or different. The people and the places that God called to himself had to be holy. That included, obviously, the tabernacle, but it even included the fields that they would sow in, that they would farm. What they did with those fields had to be different than what the pagan nations around them were doing with their fields. So while the pagan nations were greedily sowing absolutely and reaping everything that they possibly could to the very edges, what is Israel told to do? Leave the very edges. Don't reap, and don't reap all the way to the corners. Instead, leave it for those who don't have, proving your own generosity, that you're trusting God to provide for you, and that you're caring for those who are destitute, widows, orphans, strangers, those who are poor. When your olive or grapes fall to the ground as you're picking them off the vine, you don't pick them up, you leave them for people to come behind who are willing to work and gather them. That's different. You don't sow two of the same crops in the same field, Leviticus 19. That's different. All of those are, bear a mark, bear resemblance of holiness. It's just different. It's set apart. When the nations look in, we don't see that happening anywhere else. And that's the point. Everything had to be holy. Even certain times, not only people, places, but the times. God made certain times of the year holy in Israel. Uh, the certain days, every seventh day, Saturday, a Sabbath. Every seventh year, a Sabbath, the, the land would have rest. Every 50th year would have rest. Again, showing the same things. You're not going to work your land for a whole day and then for a whole seventh year, you're not going to worry about working your land. And then every 50th, 50th year, the year of Jubilee, you're going to clear all debt. It's not a principle for America, but Israel employed it. It's not about student loan forgiveness or things like that, contrary to popular, popular belief in our day. But those things governed Israel and made them holy to the other nations. The other nations would look in on that and go, no God is as wise as their God. 
We don't have a God providing for us when we're not working our land. They do. We don't worship a God who requires that kind of generosity of his people. They serve a generous, kind God who even is willing to associate with the lowly. He cares for the orphan. He cares for the widow. He provides for them and does justice on their behalf when they have no one else to. That is God, a holy God. The place, the preeminent place where God would make his holiness uniquely dwell was the tabernacle. This is why, just flip back to Exodus, uh, the last verses of Exodus, in chapter 40, this is where Moses leaves off in the Exodus, is with this amazing event once the tabernacle is erected. Now, if you're, if you're following the narrative, Moses breaks at chapter 25, and all the way from chapter 25 to chapter, through chapter 31, he has been detailing the pattern given to him for this building, for this tent. That many chapters dedicated to specific dimensions, all of the details, this is the, the instruction, the Ikea instructions, right? Except they have words, not just pictures. Moses was shown a picture, the pattern that I will show you, mirroring something that only God had access, access to in heaven, and he is describing in specific wording the dimensions of everything that's used in worship. That many chapters, not even creation gets that many chapters. Creation gets two. We have this many devoted to the tabernacle. There's a pause, there's a break after those instructions are given. Chapters uh, 32, 33, 34 are the golden calf incident when they transgress the law so soon after he's, it's been given, after they committed to obey it. And then Moses intercedes, pleads for God to be with them, the corporate seed, not just me, Moses, but all of us together, that's chapter 33, and then 34, the promise, the assurance that he will indeed dwell with his people without incinerating them along the way into the promised land. And then you pick up again, chapters 35 through 40 is the construction of the tabernacle, the making of everything. Some of you know this because you have failed on your reading plan at the end of Exodus. <laughs> It's the giving of all of those specifications and then the detailing of them making it all. And then we see repeated, and they did everything as God had told Moses. So Moses was faithful. The people obeyed. He oversaw all of the erection of the tabernacle until this very event happens. Exodus chapter 40, verse 34. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of Yahweh filled the tabernacle and Moses was not able to enter the tent because the cloud had dwelt on it and the glory of Yahweh filled the tabernacle. Now throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the sons of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, they did not set out until the day when it was taken up. For throughout all their journeys, the cloud of Yahweh was on the tabernacle by day, and there was fire in it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel. This miraculous theophany, as it's called, this appearance of God in cloud by day, in fire by night, everybody's able to see this was the center of everything they did socially, religiously, this was the center of Israelite life. When, God, when God's presence removed from the tabernacle, they packed it up and they went on the move. When God stationed himself in a certain, certain place, they settled down 
and set up the tabernacle. This is even detailed for us in Numbers. Just flip over uh, again past, past Leviticus now to Numbers chapter 2. And you'll see that even the arrangement of the tribes were all situated based on where the tabernacle was erected. Numbers chapter 2, verse 1. Now Yahweh spoke to Moses and to Aaron, saying, The sons of Israel shall camp, each by his own standard. With the banners of their father's households, they shall camp around the tent of meeting at a distance. So this tabernacle, this tent of meeting, it was the meeting place where Moses would meet with Yahweh. And then every, where every tribe goes is in respect to the tabernacle. Now, those who camp, verse 3, on the east side toward the sunrise shall be of the standard of the camp of Judah, etc. So Judah, Issachar, Zebulun were on the east. Verse 10, on the south side shall be the standard of the camp of Reuben, then Simeon, then Gad. Verse 18, on the west side shall be the standard of the camp of Ephraim by their armies and the leader of the sons of Ephraim, and then Manasseh, and then Benjamin. And finally, verse 25, on the north side shall be the standard of the camp of Dan by their armies and their leaders of the sons of Dan, and then you get Asher and Naphtali. So they're counted, they're positioned all in respect by direction, east, south, west, north, situated around the tabernacle. This is the center of all of Israel life. Um, Geographically, it's that. Spiritually, it's that. Where God dwells, Israelite life is supposed to orbit around him, around his presence, constantly in view of his holiness. This is the way that God structured them. On that uh, diagram you have there, just uh, gives the dimensions of the tent. No small place. Every time there's a mention uh, made throughout the book about God's presence, it's significant because the, the tabernacle is in view. Just like at the end of Exodus, God came to dwell with his people as we'll see in just a, a moment, every reference made to God's presence, think tabernacle. Tabernacle's in mind. And later, the temple comes to replace the tabernacle. You can just write down 1 Kings chapter 8. That's Solomon when he finally establishes the temple. And you'll see throughout his prayer in that chapter before the nation, God's temple now no longer the tabernacle, bears a unique place. Even where it's situated geographically is important. This is why David prays in the direction of Jerusalem. That's where God's holy place was. And Solomon prayed that once they were exiled, if they pray toward this place directionally, even that is an act of faith, acknowledging God is there. This is where God is caused his name to dwell. He has chosen that place, that city on planet earth forever. I believe that promise. So I am praying in that direction, asking God to restore his people. You cannot dump the significance of Jerusalem, where God had uh, determined for his name to dwell, as well as the house that he established for himself. That tabernacle nor the temple stand today. God has not forgotten his promises. There will one day be a place significant to God, holy to God, in that same location. At this point in the narrative, Leviticus, that place currently stood. And so in Leviticus, with respect to that place, here's what we get. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, the sacrifices for sin, the washings, all of these rituals that are articulated in Leviticus 
are intended to move us from death or uncleanness to move the people in the direction of what is clean and holy and has a semblance of life to it. Not just physical life, but quality of life where they are acceptable to God, their sins are forgiven. They are welcomed into his presence because they are pure, clean, holy. And so things are intended to move into that direction. By contrast, things that are profane or polluted or unclean move away from God's standard of holiness. And so this is why we see sacrifices being offered not only for sin, but also for uncleanness. All of these things are part and parcel of God calling his people to be holy to himself One author says, in Leviticus, the call was for those who were declared holy in status to move away from death toward life, becoming holy in state or condition, i.e., be holy for I am holy. And we get that just repeated a number of times in Leviticus. Uh, We'll see that in in our themes. Just just thinking about the themes in this book for a moment. Here are the, the themes that we get in the book. First off, God speaking. God is constantly speaking in Leviticus. In fact, the entire book is essentially, with a few exceptions, the entire book of Leviticus is a monologue. I don't know if you've ever noticed that when you've read. It's just God talking pretty much the whole time. And you get breaks for God to say, you know, Moses catches a breath and then says, then Yahweh said to Moses... And then God picks back up monologuing. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. God is speaking up to this point. There's a breath. Chapter 4, verse 1. Then Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, and then he continues speaking, 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 speaking. Here are the exceptions to this in the book. Basically, chapters 8, 9, and 10 are Moses narrating. And then chapter 24, 26, and 27, you get a break for narration. Outside of that, it's all God's speech, which basically makes Leviticus the longest monologue from God himself in Scripture. Where else can you find God, his words straight from him in this same way? Nowhere. God's attributes, uh, just to call attention to two attributes that are just take up a significant theme in Leviticus, and this is what we've already mentioned, his presence and his holiness. His presence and his holiness. Um, If you look online, you can see the the number of verses committed to his presence and his holiness, but there are actually more references to God's presence than there are to his holiness in the book of Leviticus. Just dozens and dozens of references to God's holiness. Let me show you, or God's presence, rather. Let me show you a few of these. Chapter 1, verse 2. Speak to the sons of Israel... And say to them, when any man from among you brings an offering near to Yahweh, there's your reference to his presence, near to Yahweh, you shall bring your offering of animals from the herd or from the flock. Chapter 1, verse 3, if his offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he shall bring it near, another reference to God's presence, He shall bring it near a male without blemish. He shall bring it near to the doorway of the tent of meeting that he may be accepted before Yahweh. Notice to bring it near to Yahweh, verse 2, and to bring it near, verse 3, is the same as bringing it near the doorway of the tent of meeting. To approach God's presence is to come to the tabernacle. Verse 11, and he shall slaughter it on the side of the altar northward 
before Yahweh. And Aaron's sons, the priests, shall splash its blood around on the altar. So to be near, near to Yahweh, to bring something to Yahweh means to be before him, literally in front of his face. To be in front of his face is at the tabernacle. Next time you read Leviticus, try just marking in your Bible every place where before Yahweh is mentioned. You'll hardly miss a chapter when before Yahweh is mentioned. Look at chapter 10, verse 1. This is the famous incident of Nadab and Abihu, Aaron's elder sons, offering strange fire. They come to worship God, but outside of his prescribed means, and they die for it. Then Nadab and Abihu, verse 1, the sons of Aaron, took their respective fire pans and put fire in them. They, then they placed incense on it and offered strange fire, here's your word, before Yahweh, which he had not commanded them. And the fire came out from the presence of Yahweh and consumed them, and they died before Yahweh. Notice, before Yahweh, the presence of Yahweh, before Yahweh. To be in front of his face is to be in his presence. To be before him is to be in his presence. And anyone in his presence had to be holy by his standard, by the God-ordained, by god prescribed means, they had to worship him. Anything outside of that was worthy of death. And so fire comes out from his presence and consumes them. Look at verse 3. Then Moses said to Aaron, it is, it is what Yahweh spoke, saying, by those who come near me, I will be treated as holy, and before all the people, I will be glorified. To glorify God is to treat him as holy. This is what must be done by the people, by his priests. That has direct application for us. To not regard God, to not treat him as holy, to not worship him as he has prescribed. That's not just coming here in a place gathered corporately on Sundays but to not regard or treat God and uphold him as holy in your own thought life, to not do that before other people publicly. This is to not glorify him. And as we see here with these two men, each of those sins, aberrant thoughts, aberrant words, sinful motives, sinful deeds, all of those things are worthy of death. To be an improper worshiper, the penalty, the worthy penalty is death. Look at chapter 16, verse 1. Shortly after this event, God speaks again to Moses. Now Yahweh spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they came near the presence of Yahweh and died. And Yahweh said to Moses, tell your brother Aaron that he shall not enter at any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat, which is on the ark, so that he will not die. For I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. Aaron shall enter the holy place with this, with a bull from the herd, for a sin offering, and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen tunic, and the linen undergarments shall be next to his body, and he shall be girded with the linen sash and attired with the linen turban. These are the holy garments. Then he shall bathe his body in water and put them on. And he goes on and on, talking about how he has to prepare himself for that ominous day of atonement. Being in the presence of God is no small matter. One had to be 
holy. And just look at the repetition as a, 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 a second, close second attribute of God is his holiness. Chapter 10, verse 3, we've already seen it. I will be treated as holy by those who approach me. He must be regarded as holy, treated as holy, because he is holy. Chapter 11, verse 44, he says this again. For I am Yahweh your God, therefore set yourselves apart as holy and be holy, for I am holy. And you shall not make for yourselves unclean, and you shall not make yourselves unclean with any of the swarming things that move on the earth. Why? Verse 45, for I am Yahweh who brought you up from the land of Egypt to be your God. Thus you shall be holy, for I am holy. Chapter 20, verse 3. He says, I will also set my face against that man and will cut him off from among his people because he has given some of those who are his seed to Melech so as to defile my sanctuary and profane my holy name. Again, God is holy. His name, his reputation or character is holy. Verse 26 of the same chapter, again, God's holiness. Thus you shall be holy to me, for I, am Yah- for I Yahweh, am holy, and I have separated you from the peoples to be mine. So this theme of God's presence, God's holiness, are so prominent in Leviticus. They go hand in hand. And again, as we've just seen, that another theme, uh, the fourth one that's listed on the outline, his saying, I am Yahweh, I am Yahweh, I am Yahweh, just time and time again. All of the, the, the laws that he is laying down only matter because of who he is. The standard of holiness matters because the one who's giving it is himself holy. And so he constantly draws their attention back to his person, to his name. I am Yahweh. Just look at chapter 19, verse 3. Obedience to parents matters for this reason. Every one of you shall fear his mother and his father, and you shall keep my Sabbaths. Why? I am Yahweh your God. Verse 4, do not turn to idols or make for yourselves molten gods. I am Yahweh your God. Verse 10, nor shall you glean your vineyard, nor shall you gather the falling fruit of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the afflicted and for the sojourner. I am Yahweh your God. Verse 12, And you shall not swear falsely by my name so as to profane the name of your God. I am Yahweh. Verse 14, you shall not curse a deaf man, nor place a stumbling block before the blind, things for which you can't be caught. Why? You shall fear Yahweh, or you shall fear your God. I am Yahweh. Verse 18, you shall not take vengeance, and you shall not... Keep your anger against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am Yahweh. Verse 25, now in the fifth year, you shall eat of its fruit that its produce may increase for you. I am Yahweh, your God. Verse 28, and you shall not make any cuts in your body for the dead, nor make any tattoo marks on yourselves. I am Yahweh. Verse 30, you shall keep my Sabbaths and fear my sanctuary. I am Yahweh. Do not turn to mediums or spiritists. Do not seek them out to be defiled by them. I am Yahweh your God. You shall rise up before the gray-haired and honor the aged. And you shall fear your God. I am Yahweh. You can write down next to verse 32, 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 23. When that isn't practiced, children die because of it, not honoring the aged. Verse 34, the sojourners who sojourn with you, sojourner who sojourns with you, shall be to you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. 
I am Yahweh your God. Verse 36, you shall have just balances, just weights, and a just ephah, and a just henna, or hen, excuse me. I am Yahweh your God who brought you out from the land of Egypt. You shall keep all my statutes and all my judgments and do them. Why? I am Yahweh. Think about the implication for your own obedience that's being laid out here in Leviticus 19. And if you're interested in hearing more teaching, you can look on the website. Scott Maxwell has taught a, a sermon series on Leviticus 19. It was excellent. All of their obedience only matters because of who God is. So for us, where we find ourselves lacking obedience in some area, where do we need to look to first? What is my opinion about God? If you have a low view of God, if you have a small view of God, then you will have a small view of obedience. If you don't know God as well as you ought to, if in those moments of temptation, your heart isn't so saturated with God's truth that you call him to mind, oh, God is sovereign. He is my Lord. I have to obey him. He's the God who is always present with me. I must obey him. He is the God who rescued a people out of Egypt with no help. I can trust him in this moment of temptation. He's not lacking power to rescue me either. I can trust him. I must obey him. I'm constantly quarreling with those around me. I must have a small view of who God is in those moments. I'm constantly fearful or anxious. I need to strengthen, bolster my view of who God is. God's humble. I should be that way. Remembering who God is would increase our obedience to him. That's what he is reminding Israel of. You must know me so that you obey me. Lastly, the, the third theme I just want to draw our attention to is, is that of atonement. Atonement. To have a covering for sin so that the one whose sins are being covered is clean before God and forgiven. That is what is provided for. That's what's in view when it comes to atonement. Atonement had to be made for sins and for cleansing for the sake of purity. And so from the outset of the book, atonement, this covering that cleanses the worshiper from sins, is in view. Chapter 1, verse 4. The priest shall lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering that it may be accepted for him to make atonement on his behalf. Or excuse me, the, the sons of Israel would bring these, these burnt offerings from the herd. And as the one who brought the offering laid his hand on the head of the burnt offering, it was so that he would be accepted when atonement was made on his behalf. That's the goal, acceptability before God. Chapter 7, verse 7, reiterates this. The guilt offering is like the sin offering. There is one law for them. The priest who makes atonement with it shall have it. So again, here we see atonement had to come through the priest. Chapter 8, verse 34 Yahweh has commanded to do as has been done this day to make atonement on your behalf. This was the pattern for consecrating Aaron and his sons. Then chapter 9, they actually do it. Moses then said to Aaron, come near to the altar and offer your sin offering and your burnt offering that you may make atonement for yourself and for the people, then offer the offerings for the people that you may make atonement for them, just as Yahweh commanded. Even if we skip ahead, chapter 23, toward the end of the book, we see atonement still in view. Chapter 23, verse 27. 
Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, on exactly the 10th day of this seventh month is the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you and you shall humble your souls and bring an offering by fire near to Yahweh. And you shall not do any work on this same day for it is a day of atonement to make atonement on your behalf before Yahweh your God. Chapter 25, verse 9. Again, atonement in view. You shall then sound a ram's horn abroad on the tenth day of the seventh month, on the day of atonement. You shall sound a horn all through your land. This acceptable, this, this means of acceptability before God, necessary for sinners, they needed a priest to make atonement so that they would have atonement. They would have this covering, cleansing, so that they would be acceptable before God. One last thing to just mention, uh, as you read Leviticus, the proper way to read Leviticus, uh, some have made much about seeing Christ in all of Scripture, as, it, as it's said. We can in a sense, see Christ in Leviticus. But readers would do well to take the words of Leviticus at face value and avoid attempts to discover Christ in every minute detail of the biblical text. The meaning of the words of Leviticus in this current church age are the same as when Moses first penned them. And that's important. Uh, There are volumes that have been written about how the dimensions of the tabernacle or the material with which they were made, the tabernacle was made show Christ in some way. You know, you get this detailing of the joints that are supposed to fit the frames together and ha-ha, Christ in some way is in that, that detail. And so people resort to weird numerology and reading things into the numbers or the dimensions. There's really no need to do those things. God gave Moses a pattern. Moses copied the pattern as articulated by God. But there are principles that we see that help us appreciate the person, work, and offices of Christ. Just for example, God's holiness As one first principle, God's holiness cannot be approached by unholy sinners. That's a principle that we see so clearly on the pages of Leviticus. God is holy. Unholy sinners can't approach him, can't be near him, can't be in his presence. So what does that do for the New Testament reader looking back? How should we be instructed? We should receive that instruction. And since we have a mediator now, this side of the cross, therefore we can appreciate Christ, the perfect son of God, who must mediate on our behalf. You see one principle in Leviticus, that God can't be approached by unholy sinners. And so we should appreciate, that should increase our appreciation for Christ, who mediates for us, who makes us acceptable by removing our sin, expiating our sin at the cross, justifying us, declaring us righteous, imputing our sin to him and his righteousness to us by virtue of a blameless account, and making it so that we now can approach him. Let me just read from Hebrews. The author of Hebrews just so well picks up on this without changing any Old Testament meaning. Verse 14 of Hebrews 4. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us take hold of our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things like we are yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We now can draw near to God's throne of grace. It's a throne of grace for us, not judgment because of Christ. 
He cannot be approached, but because of Christ, now we may approach God with confidence even. Another principle, as you read Leviticus, sinners need a priest to mediate and offer sacrifices on their behalf before God. Clear from Leviticus. Everybody is not allowed to enter into the Holy of Holies, only one person and even that once a year. So what? We can't approach God. We need a mediator. Who's going to mediate for us in a permanent way? 1 Timothy 2.5, there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He's the high priest who makes us acceptable and God accessible. As we just read, now we can draw near with confidence. Uh, Thirdly, as you read Leviticus, notice that God accepts sinners on the basis of of a perfect sacrifice offered for sins. Over and over, it has to be a blameless lamb. A blameless or spotless ox, goat, ram, without blemish. Those things, just anticipating a perfect sacrifice, again, Christ is that. A priest who has passed through the heavens, perfect, holy, blameless, without blemish. Christ is a perfect sacrifice. By contrast, he's the only priest who became the sacrifice. The picture there is Christ entering into God's presence as the acceptable priest, high priest, but without any blood in his hands, he offered him his own blood. He didn't put blood on the altar. He got on the altar himself, brought his own blood, became the sacrifice, God was the one making the sacrifice. God sacrificed the priest who gave himself as the blameless offering. And then just to note, you know, this, the animal sacrifices were obviously insufficient. Obviously. That's why they made them time and time again. If anybody in Israel was under the delusion that the blood of goats, and ox, oxen would finally atone for their sins, that delusion would be resolved for them the very next year on the Day of Atonement. Nope, we're making another one. What? I thought my sins were covered. They were, temporarily, and now you need another one. So when we read Leviticus, or even what Hebrews says, we can take both at face value. When God said time and time again that when that worshiper who by faith brought the offering, brought the uh, sacrifice to the priest, and it was offered the way God said it should be and that he would be forgiven, you can take that at face value. He was forgiven temporarily until the next time he had to bring a sacrifice. And when Hebrews says that he brought a once and for all sacrifice, being empowered by the eternal spirit to offer it to God, that's a different type of atonement, a permanent one, a sufficient one. So in these ways, we can just appreciate the difference between the Old Testament sacrifices and Christ's sacrifice, just to read through these. In Leviticus, you get an old covenant, a temporary one. Christ has a new covenant. You get obsolete promises. Christ has better promises that endure. You get a shadow versus the reality. You get the Aaronic priesthood versus a Melchizedekian priesthood that endures forever. Christ doesn't have a, another priest coming after him because he's not of Aaron. You get a sinful priesthood in one, but a sinless priest in another limited by death priesthood in one, but a forever priesthood in Christ's priesthood, daily sacrifices versus a once-for-all sacrifice, animal sacrifices versus a sacrifice of God's Son, ongoing sacrifices versus a sacrifice no longer needing another one, and and sacrifices no longer needed, and then you get a one-year atonement versus an eternal propitiation. Christ's sacrifice is just superior in every possible way.
three things Leviticus should do for us. It should make us recognize the unapproachable holiness of God. Regard God as holy. After we read Leviticus, when we read Leviticus, we should be thoroughly convinced that the God whose words we hold is holy. Every sin must be punished. Every sin must be forgiven if we would be acceptable in his sight. It teaches us that God is holy. Be reminded as you read this book, the God that I serve, the God who saved me, he is perfectly, utterly holy. Also, secondly, we should draw near to God on his terms. The God who is so holy has provided a way for sinners to draw near him. It is arrogant to seek to draw near to him any other way. Then and now. Regard God as holy. Come through the way that he has provided. And finally, those who do regard God as holy, who have drawn near to him by his God-ordained means, should then go, for, go there for and be holy as he is holy. All of us, all of you who have, with believing hearts, dared to believe God and draw near to him on his terms, now since you have been accepted, since you have been declared holy by him positionally, become what you are practically. Be holy as he is holy. And that is our enduring work as believers to obey all that Jesus has commanded us in the scriptures. Amen. God, thank you for this incredible book that you would reveal, not just to provide a way but, and leave us guessing, but you would actually reveal a way to be accepted before you. I pray that we would return again, with joyful and eager expectation uh, to this book of Leviticus, and that you would use it to renew our minds, that you would use it to instruct us, and that you would even make it bear more prominent place in our encouragement and in our counsel and in our instruction to one another in this body. Be pleased to use it in our lives, and that we would, by that way, have an ever-growing admiration, a, a reverence, and a fear of you also that you might be honored in our lives, that you might be obeyed, and that you might be more readily believed and trusted by the saints in this church. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.